Hey everyone, this is Chris Keys for Premier Guitar today. I'm at the Ryman Auditorium with Adam from the War on Drugs. Adam, how you doing? How you doing? Doing real great well. Great to see you again. Yeah, great to see you as well. Uh, you're on tour, finally promoting the record that came out last year. Yep. Got some new friends, you got some old friends. We see some, uh, you know, the White Falcon here that's yep. been there Classic. since, uh, what, I think you did it with Bollinger in 2013 or 2014? That, yeah, I got that in 2014, yeah. Okay. But you got a yeah. lot of new friends, so let's just dive right in, Adam. Uh, what, sure. What do you want to talk about first? First one maybe is this one. Nothing special, but it's a. Um, this belonged to my friend Jesse Turbovich, uh, who plays guitar in Kurt Vile's band. Yeah. yeah. And I remember Jesse bought this on tour uh, years ago, and I always thought the neck was really sweet. It's a '57 reissue. Okay. And I guess they didn't make a ton of these. Anyway, a couple years ago he got a Olympic white um, '70s Strat, and wanted to get rid of this so I bought it from him uh, to kind of keep in the family and yeah. I know like Jer Jesse's punk rock spirit is in this so uh, I just love I just love it's a little lower output which is nice because you can kind of juice it okay with some pedals but uh, I really like this guitar um, I don't know much about it just 57 reissue is it more of a live guitar or is it a yeah uh, I studio? only I used it uh, I didn't use it on the record okay because uh, it was in a warehouse and Carson, California. And you guys kind of recorded and tracked all over the place. Yeah. Yeah, I only really use like two guitars for recording. Okay. Um, I guess this is the this SG, the 69 SG. Um, is that the one everyone knows that you record or does that one stay home? Because I know that no, you this is one of the only ones I use for recording actually. Okay. But live it doesn't really work as well with the rig, um, which we can get into later, but uh, I love this guitar. Um, I got it at Rivington Guitars in New York. What do you dig about it? Sound feel? Yeah, it's just like... Why is it the one? I don't know why I dig about it. I just know... I mean, does it stay in tune? Not really. <laughs> you know, I don't know what I dig about it. It's just sometimes it's just the one. It's like when we were recording that song, Victim, I was doing um, a vocal at Sean's just in his studio there and doing a guide vocal and had a guitar in my hand and I feel like when this thing's in my hand I can just like react with it and it becomes like a whole other animal yeah. in a way that other guitars don't. Like with the bar, it's kind of unwieldy but like this guitar just plugged into like my Princeton or Tweed or whatever, just cranked, it just sounds incredible. Now I ask a question that's probably detrimental to my our career here at Premier Guitar. You write and record with so few guitars but Clearly, you bring a lot of friends out on the road. Yeah. What's the difference there? What's I don't want to say the disconnect, but what, is it just for fun, or is it you know because you write these realistically, songs? Realistically, yeah, fun. Okay. <laughs> At least you're honest. Um, because there's no. I mean, I could play the whole set. I could play the whole whole tour with like three guitars. Mm -hmm. Basically, the Falcon, a Strat, and maybe a Jazzmaster. But then we'd have five empty spaces, and then Don would have a lot of free time. So what are we? You know, I mean, then this one is the other one I record with, which is a 60, a Jazzmaster 60s. It's, we call it the 62, but I don't think it is a 62. Mm. I think it's a 63. But this one was funny because um, I saw this on Reverb like six years ago at Chelsea Guitars in New York. And it was like kind of a pretty good price. And I watched it for like a, a month and it was still there. And then one day it was gone. I was like, oh, someone got that great. I think it was 63 on the website, or 64. Um, and then like two months after that, I was in New York and I got dropped off the Lincoln Tunnel and walked over to Chelsea Guitars. I was like, oh, I've never been there. And I walk in and on the bench was this guitar, like kind of all taken apart. And I was like, what's up with that? And they're like, oh, this is Jazzmaster. I was like, is that the one that was on Reverb like three months ago? They're like, yeah, like the guy who bought it took the neck off and he wanted a his birth year, which is a 64, but it turned out to be a 63. So he returned it, and when he returned it, the low E string chipped. Like he, he you know, ruined the, uh, the tuner. So he's like, I'll give you a deal if, because it doesn't have the original tuner. So I was like, so I bought it right there. Crazy great price. And it's just such a killer axe. I mean, it's just, it's a 63 Jazzmaster, you know? And I remember I read that you kind of had a, a standoffish relationship with jazz masters for a long time because maybe misunderstood would be a word the way yeah, that you would I used play them my and friend how you use jeff them. 
had one. He had like a reissue that I really liked. I used it in the studio. But all my favorite guitar players used them. But then I got that one from Fender in 14. And I think it was, just wasn't set up right at first. And I was having a hard time like figuring. I didn't really understand all the switches. Yeah. But once I had a, dialed the rig in a bit, it became something I can really react to and like becomes like an extension of of your you know of what you're doing so like I really expressive. I really love them now now I got this black one in Australia from this guy Terry it's a 66 and it's just black you know black headstock had to Sharp. get it but this one actually the rhythm circuit sounds killer and it's like they all sound different like in the Lead circuit, it's like really bright guitar. Mm -hmm. I use this on occasional rain. I don't need to, but I do. <laughs> but I mean, it's just one of those things. Like, they all sound a little different. And that song definitely needs. I don't know if you're using like a pedal or anything, but like it has a lot, a lot of vibrato, a lot, a lot, a lot of chop. Yeah, it does. Yeah. So this nice, nice tight bar on this one. But yeah, this one's great. I love this one. You know, you got it on tour in Australia, and you remember that. That tour, that record, that was the tour we, Eagles won the Super Bowl and we won a Grammy all within a couple days and so I got the black guitar all within three, you know, That's a couple a days. That's a special instrument. So, but yeah, and then the other ones. You got the Firebird. We've had before, yeah, the Firebird. Um, the Les Paul, I remember. Yeah, the 72 Les Paul and the, the new Fender, which I still love. It's like. I know now, what I'm going to get with that. So Now, out of all these, do you have one that you prefer to use live, or is it kind of just each night's its own, like, adventure when it comes to choosing instruments? Live? I really... The the, the, the 65, like, the American Vintage uh, Jazzmaster, it's just really reliable, and we've kind of put a lot of love into it, and I know what I'm going to get out of it, and I can throw it around and rip into it, and it's always just... I don't know. We love it. It's louder than obviously the vintage one. Uh, I use it on like pain. Just cuts, you know, when you have seven people on stage um, and you hit a gain pedal or a clean boost, this really just cuts in a way that you kind of want in a live environment. Mm. But I don't really use it recording because I have some nice older ones that have a little less harsh top end. But for playing live, this is, this is just always what we're, what we're looking for. Cool. Love that one. Now I see a few acoustics behind you there. Yeah, this one is a, a Hummingbird reissue. I think this one's down-tuned. Yeah, to C-sharp. Um, pick up. Now, uh, what songs are you bringing out the acoustic stuff for? Uh, I don't, if I were to, I haven't been playing a, tons of acoustic this tour, I, but I would play it on um, Buenos Aires Beach. Mm. I would use my country western that's upstairs. That's kind of the bus guitar now. Got it. Um, but Eliza and uh, Anthony both play a lot of acoustic. Uh, we have this Martin, which is Dom's. And then um, we have a Martin 12 string, it's Dom's, with a nice pickup in it. Uh, so, yeah. I should ask before we move on to amps and pedals, Adam, is uh, what strings you're using? Strings, brand? Ernie Ball. And uh, what about gauge? Tens? Elevens. Okay. Has that always been where you've been living, or is that uh, kind of yeah. a moving target? I think we've always used elevens. Some of them have... Um, <clears throat> he doesn't know that I know this. He thinks I don't know all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's like, he actually knows all that stuff? But this one is um, elevens on the top. And tens on the bottoms. Okay. Um, but yeah, elevens basically across the board. Ernie Ball, they've been awesome to us. And um, yeah, and then we just have pictures of our we got our Brad, our Bob Bradshaw carving ad. Man, that that Bob's goes, our muse. That goes back. And uh, we got Pete Townsend smashing. We got Warren over here, Warren Z. So we got our. And over here with the with the blue mask at Luma, we have all of our strats. I think I love the best that you got Bob Seeger down the middle. Yeah, we got Bob there. Got that at a record exchange in uh, Boise. So yeah, 
little little slice of home. It's like it takes me back to when I had posters on my walls in, in grade school and junior high. And stuff. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah we yeah. we get into it. So, well, speaking of getting into it, Adam, I, I know that you have a huge setup out there. Should we should we go over there? Sure, let's go uh, check it out. We're over here in your like central command mission control, yeah. Adam. Um, the one thing I noticed that's different, and we'll start there, is no high watts. No high watts. No. I. Um, what gives? I it's always just kind of getting chasing other stuff, and um, it's all about. Um, I mean, the high watts were great. I loved that that era, but um, I got into these alembics a couple years ago. Um, are you familiar with the alembic thing at all? Just vaguely. So basically, made most famous by Jerry and yep. David Gilmore. It's it's the front end of a dual showman. Um, but you have to use your own power amp, obviously. And that's where the Mesa comes in. Right. So I got into this, the Alembic thing, and it's so, it's all clean headroom. I mean, they're just, they're so, they're so creamy. And with, I don't know what it is, but with single coils, maybe that's why Jerry and Gilmore used them so much. With Strats and P90s, it really brings them to life in a way that, like, other amps don't. So... I got into that and then various, I also have this high watt power amp that I've never really seen another one of, um, but I like the Mesa more. Um, and they're stereo, so they have three outs in the back. They have left, right, and then the summed. So you can cascade. I don't, I don't really do that, but I'll do it in the studio, but you can like, you know, use the second channel as a master volume or, and there's bright switches and you can cascade the bright switches and the tone stacking is really killer on them. Um, flexible platform. Really flexible. And like with my rig, like it's basically built on mostly like strats and jazz masters. So mm -hmm. you can get them really clear and, and loud. Um, and as you keep adding a few levels of clean gain for more sustain, it always takes it and just, they're really great. Um, so that is this side. I use one channel of Alembic and I got, how many speakers do you think are in this cab? I'm going to guess four. Two. <laughs> Completely um, inappropriate, but yeah, I I got I mean, it from somebody in Dayton. Imagine two fifteens. Yeah, no. two twelves. Okay, it's like a twenty forty one or something. But I just love I just love the way it looks. Um, so that's one side, and then the other side is the Bandmaster uh, through the four twelve. Um, and then this is kind of like I have eight channels the Alembic or four channels for backup, and I do run one line. Um, directly out of the Alembic to the house for some clean, like, DI stuff. Um, but it's basically just one side Alembic and one side Bandmaster. And where's the Swart come in? The Swart is kind of the third amp. So, um, I got the Swart, I put the Swart in because when I use the SG, like, something about the humbuckers, it doesn't sound as good with the Alembic. Mm. So when I, if I use the humbuckers, I usually use the Swart instead of the Alembic. And is um, the Swart working otherwise without when the SG is involved? Sometimes I'll use it as like a, basically a tremolo pedal. Oh, okay. yeah. Like at the end of pressure, I'll just turn it on and have it on this deep tremolo. But usually it's on for um, thinking of a place and um, living proof when I use the SG. Okay. Um, but normally it's um, the Bandmaster in the, in the Alembic with the Marshall. And it's just, you know, you can get, you know, and I have the power soaks. So in a room like tonight, I can back off a little bit, but I can still keep all the gain structure as I want. I don't have to start messing with the... And you don't have to worry about taking out the stained glass at the rhyme Right, here. exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I, li I like these power soaks a lot. Um, but yeah, the high, I miss the high watts, but um, I'm sure they'll come back one day. But that's what Gilmore would do. He would bypass the input of his high watt, use the Alembic as the front end, and they modded out the uh, preamp section. Why didn't you do that? Because, um, I don't know, because <laughs> I just bought four. <laughs> but, um, but they still make the red ones with this creamy red. That's like the, a certain era of the Alembic, the Sebastopol era. And then they still make them. And this is the newer one. The F2B, but they sound identical. I mean, it's such a great 
small business that's been going since late 60s in Santa Rosa, California. I mean, you know, they were basically, I think the reason they made the Alembic was because when Jerry started using the wall of sound yeah. and the Macintoshes, he was like, well, let me just take out the front end of your showman instead of lugging this Fender showman around. I'll just make the front end of it, plug into that, and then into your Alembic and then into the wall of sound. So I think at first it was maybe out of ease, but I mean, you know, I have this poster in my studio of the dead Jerry playing alligator and like he has like 10 channels of Alembic and Bobby has like 10 channels over it. It's like they're just racked up with Sebastopol era Alembic, so. Life goals. Yeah. <laughs> but no, they sound killer and it's just like they're just super wide open and the tone stacking's killer and just with the strats and the, it really brings those single coils to life in a way that I haven't had luck with other amps. Well, so. right on, Adam. Thank you for uh, summarizing your triumphant triumph yep. of tone here. Uh, but let's move on to pedals. You've got a, a workstation, we'll call it. A wraparound workstation. Yeah. I think last time we did this, I was still like, I didn't fully grasp. Like, I knew how it worked, but I think in the years since, we've really kind of taken Bob's board and turned it into something that really runs the show. I mean, we used uh, this MPC for all the drum machines. Like, there's no tracks, it's just like drum machines. Um, so I can start and stop them from here. Okay. Um, depending on the song that I click to. And these pedals are all for the, the drum machine volumes. Okay. So we can hear something in our ears, but then I can bring it in and out of the, the house. And this is like maybe a a percussive loop or a, a synthesizer loop or something. Um, but yeah. And you're doing obviously all the controls or at least most of the ch changes with the switcher there itself? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like this button here, this expansion, that's basically one loop, but it's all these pedals. You know? So if I hit this button, it activates the digital dimension, the timeline, and the looper as one looper, as one loop. Got it. But everything else is basically on its own loop. Um, I just put in this, I had a slow gear, but I just put in this dynamic filter the other day. How are you using that? Uh, probably poorly, but... Um, <laughs> Way to know. sell yourself short, yeah. Adam. Just like that, basically. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's only been a couple days in, but it's fun. Um, we have, I have this, this is a cool pedal, this is the um, Lightfoot Labs Goat Keeper, one of the original ones. The OG one, yeah, because it takes clock in, sync in, so we, we take clock, um, MIDI to CV, and it, for, so any song that, like with a drum machine, everything's clocked, so I hit that pedal, and the guitar's just pulsing in time with the song. Yeah. And you can change the subdivisions and they're really cool. I mean And then everyone's on the same page when you guys are all engaged on that. Yeah, it changes. I shape. like how it flutters between the repeats and the yeah, you can do a lot of... Man, that's a... Experience of, upon itself, in itself. Yeah, like when everything's pulsing, yeah. and me, Dave, and Anthony are all all locked in off that goat keeper. It's pretty cool. Um, and then, yeah, and then I kind of got into the Eventide prog programmable thing, because I hook them up to my computer and dial it in change it every night if I want a little different, you know, you went down the that H9. Black hole. I did go down that black hole, <laughs> but it's nice. I mean, they're really stable and they sound great. And um, basically we're in song mode on this thing. So every song has its own. So I click over to, you know, whatever, red eyes. Then those change to whatever I programmed for that song. 
So I used to just have a digital delay that was always the same thing. I never changed it. Yeah. And it was fine, but I just thought I'd get into a little bit more deeper, deeper wormhole with this stuff. Now, how are you using, or what is coming out of the H9? I know, because that's such a versatile pedal. Yeah, that's pedal. the same thing, basically, for certain songs, like for Red Eyes, I have this time trim, and then for uh, Occasional Rain, it's like a wide chorus, and then... Uh, Harmonious Dream, it's like a... Slow phase, you know, different for each song. Sometimes it's just a compressor. Um, but yeah, I like that pedal too. And then uh, I see you got the, you got full tone, you got an Archer. Yeah, I like the Archer, that thing's cool. Um, Smaller one too, so it gives you a little yeah. bit more real estate. Yeah, I've had this forever, the Bun Runner. Which I didn't realize was designed by Drew from um, Switchfoot. I did not know. Oh, Drew certainly, yeah. Yeah, I didn't realize because he, he was working with our friend Tony Berg and we were at Tony's studio and he was like, he sent me one of the pedals he's designed. I didn't realize that he designed the Bun Runner for JHS, so. Um, and exactly what pedal is that? I, it, I see like a tape, it's, it's a fuzz of some sort? Yeah, this is a fuzz, yeah, it's the right side. It's a JHS Bun Runner. The right side is a, um, what's that famous pedal? Um, I forget. We'll insert it somewhere <laughs> when we figure it out. Yeah, what is it called? The, um, I'm blanking. It's basically two famous fuzzes. This is a super fuzz, and this is a, um, I forget. Someone in the comments will I know. never use the left side. Um, I'm just drawing a blank, but I've used it for I don't know, nine years now. Oh, wow. Um, and sometimes you're playing a festival and it doesn't work because it's germanium. Oh, but temperamental. That's part of the game, yeah. Um, so we have a backup, different silicone pedal. But, but yeah, this thing's great. Um, this prunes and custard uh, is the, I only use it on victim because that's the sound of the solo. I was going to ask that, that yeah, outro that's solo. That. Um, it's tempting to not use it on every song, but it's but it's cool because on that song we we split like it has a, a direct line to the alembic and just straight di into the house it sounds killer. Yeah. Um, this digital dimension is like a '80s boss pedal. Yeah. How are you using that different than what comes out of the H9? I know that you had mentioned that 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 provides some choruses. Yeah. I just for some reason that has chorus. That has chorus. This has chorus. I just use this on the record a lot on the keyboards, um, and I had a couple different chorus pedals there, and I just, it's really simple, and it has like basically an EQ knob to just make it a little bit brighter. You can kind of tailor it to your sound. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get as dark as maybe like some of the more analog sounding chorus pedals that maybe just get a little muddier in a live setting, so a lot of this, the goal with this stuff is to just make sure you don't get too murky yeah. in the live thing. As Dave can, was saying, or Dave uh, said off camera beforehand, was that he used the word soupy. That's a, a right. good word to, to describe that. Yeah, they can get, yeah, brothy, yeah. Ooh, yeah, that's another good one too, yeah. brothy. <laughs> now, um, yeah, I see you got a flanger and a hard wire up here, reverb. Uh, what's the flanger? Yep. That's the ADA flanger. Oh, okay. Um, that they made pedal board friendly and that's just an always on so that's just that just basically gives a subtle chorus between the two the left and right amps mm -hmm. like without it you know that's just a subtle little depth so every song I, I click to that's always on. Yeah, how are you hitting the effects? Are they hitting the Olympic or the Fender or both? Yeah, everything's coming out of the board okay. straight into the amps. Okay. I've, I've been trying to figure out a wet, dry thing, but I don't think that's for me. Um, but yeah, I just straight into the amps. Hmm. Um, 
and that hard wire is basically just set on a reverse reverb. That. You know, that's funny, last time we did this, I was talking to John Bollinger, I was like, and this is the reverse reverb, and I like couldn't figure out, it wasn't working. <laughs> so the end of the video is like, so luck, thank God it actually worked this, this time. This time it worked. Um, and you know, we have this switcher here. I do use a Kemper, I have a Kemper like behind oh, really? that rack. That's just getting the same feed. Um, but it's just kind of like a, Worst case scenario thing, if amps go down or... Matty, our front of house guy, he can blend a little bit. It actually sounds pretty good. I got... I'm using like a 66 Pro Reverb pack I got from somebody. Mm. And I mean, I can't really do too deep a dive on that thing. Like I haven't like profiled my own amps or anything, but... I was really pleased with just how it took some of the pedals. And in like a... Worst case scenario at a festival, if something breaks, yeah. to be able to flip to that. Um, a nice little safety net. Yeah, and he can feather it in too, even if he's not getting enough of something one night from a mic, he can feather that in or... Um, but yeah, it's been cool. I mean, this tour, I feel like we definitely went a little deeper on um, the role the Bradshaw plays, like with controlling the, the MPC, in song mode for everything and, um, you know, having a lot of options for the, the MPC has six outputs on it. So I have basically a pedal for each stereo output. Do you, does it free you up in, in the moment when you're performing and you have less uh, tight roping and uh, tap dancing to do? Well, luckily I have Dominic because Dominic does a lot of the, I did see a switcher the switchers now. Over there because the Because like for Victim, like right before that solo section, I have like, I'm like on four pedals, like a fuzz, a verb, whatever, a, a, a boost. And then it has to like go right into that crazy solo, which is both amps get turned off, the DI gets turned on, the delays get turned off. So I can only do like two of those switches. So he does like three button, you know, he'll switch off like four things at once. Mm -hmm. And other songs he'll hit a, um, like in the song Pain, like when I go to the solo, sometimes it's like I'm trying to deliver the last line of the song and then just, if I have to like look down and hit the right button, it can just take you out of it. Yeah. So luckily Dom just hits that OCD so I can just play, you know? Just keep it in yeah, the moment. Yeah, it's like super helpful, like a, certain, a couple songs where having somebody else just, you know, hit that one pedal or turn off the amps or turn off the DI or whatever it might be frees you up just a little bit, but then, you know, allows your mind to stay with the task yeah, at hand. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes it, the tap dancing is just a little, sometimes it, it's what takes you into that other place, but sometimes it's like more of a hassle. It keeps you tethered. Yeah. So sometimes it'd be nice to just, which we've really figured out how to do together. So that's, that's awesome. Um, and, um, Adam, I think the only one that we haven't really touched on or spoke about is the timeline. Oh, yeah. Now, how's that getting used differently than the time factor of the H9? Timeline is, um, it's actually getting clock. Okay. So, so it's part of that equation with the go keep. Kind of, yeah. It's like basically if I want it, I still, I put it in the rig at the beginning of the European tour and, um, that we just got back from. Because sometimes I want like, like for pressure or something or, a certain section just want a little bit more atmospheric delay or something. Not like a smeary thing, just like a little heavier thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is getting clocked, so I always know it's like in time with that song if I want it to be, if that's important, you know? But um, it's a timeline, it's a great pedal. I just basically have two settings on it. I haven't gone too deep on it. Um, As Bollinger would say, that's like taking a Ferrari to the get groceries. Because that pedal can do is, Yeah, you can do <laughs> a lot with that. Can you can, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And actually, now I see Honestly, the it's like playing a 63 Jazzmaster in this band. You know, it's like, <laughs> what's, what am I really doing with this? Hey, you know, I didn't say that. You're pummeling did. it with clean gain and, and flanger. But, but I really like it. And um, 
they just sound great and they're really transparent and uh the one thing i did i saw poke out just now is that white pedal at the top next to your switcher what's that it's kind of turned yeah so that's knobs. a um uh ren and cuff uh tripod silicone fuzz okay that i've had for a long time is that the back up here for the no so that's basically um so like all these pedals are on the switcher mm -hmm. right so if like the fuzz stopped working. I just, if I didn't hit that button, you wouldn't know it wasn't working. It's just out of the loop. Yep. But um, if you want to have a volume pedal, you kind of have to interrupt the signal. So it's like a send and return from the brain to the volume pedal. And so we basically just extended the volume pedal loop. So it's volume pedal into this Bob Bradshaw clean gain mm -hmm. and then into this fuzz and then back to the switcher. So if those started crapping out you'd hear it because it's an active loop part of it yeah um but with all the clean gain at the beginning i thought that having a fuzz in the middle of the like right after all the gains and right before the modulation you could just go like instead of getting squeezed you could just go a little extra uh -huh. so we just have that pedal dimed out and um you know sure you do it's basically <laughs> Um, and I got this, you know, cool switch looper, so I don't have to hit the pedal, I just hit the looper. Yeah. Turn it, take it in and out. But that pedal sounds great, all his stuff sounds great. And, um, yeah, and it's always changing, you know, sometimes I got that dynamic filter and that and the slow gear both took 12 volts, so I just took the slow gear out, mm. put that in. Just right before a show, put something new in and like try to find something new during a show. Is that something that happens a lot through the tour? Is is the kind of the mix and match of new pedals and stuff? Yeah, sometimes, yeah. Like, I feel like changes usually get made like in this spot or in the expansion board. Like I'll try out different loopers or different chorus pedals or a different delay or... Never enough chorus for you. Yeah, and yet, yeah, I know, I know. I know, sometimes it, it's, just how you hear it with these in-ears monitors, it's different here than it is in reality. Yeah. So you're trying to like get wide. It's like the audience isn't really experiencing like width. Mm. But it's, it's helpful for some reason if you kick into like, like in pressure when we come back or something and I hit this one chorus and it gets wide in my ears, like elevates my moment or something but in reality i think it's just one big chorus sound yeah for everyone else which is fine there's so it's so, so the difference between the choruses are so subtle now one last question adam is this replicated for a european rig or is this all come with you and this i is wish now we've, we've talked about it but this this all goes to europe oh, okay yeah everything on the stage i mean it's too it'd be too It'd be too insane to try and double the rig. Yeah. Especially with Robbie's I mean, I think keyboards and like, you know. I think some people watching this, knowing that you take this complete setup overseas, probably think that's a gamble too. Right. <laughs> For sure. No, we've, we've had good luck with it. And um, it's, you know, that's the thing. It's like, that's, it's just all of this stuff is, it's part of the sound of the live band. You know, it's kind of what we've been, Every tour, we've done so many tours in 15 years, it's like every tour you're adding a piece and trying to figure out a new piece of gear and how it can help the show. And then, yeah, then one day you're like, oh, we should really scale down. And you're like, well, how do we scale down? Like every, everybody is so dialed into their, their setups, you know? Yeah. And like tailored their gear really to all the different tasks they have in the band, so. And it's kind of, you guys form a, a bigger organism when you're working together in full flight and yeah. making everything fly. Yeah, like the goalkeeper thing was, that was a new thing this cycle, was figuring out how to, do, how, how to like lock in with MIDI, but we're not, not without using tracks, you know? Yeah. And all three of us having those goat keepers, it's just a subtle way of all locking in. You just play whatever you want, but you're all pulsing, you know, along with the tempo of the song or the drums or whatever. 
and he's getting clocks, so his everything's locked in, but it's kind of this cool like analog way of doing it. Who cracked the code for that out of the band? Like who brought that solution to We were rehearsing and I had that goat keeper for a couple years and um, I knew it took clock, but for some reason I guess I wasn't hitting it hard enough with clock because I was never getting it to work. Mm. And then in one of our early rehearsals, we figured out how to, we just have to basically clobber it with, Smash with, it. with, with signal. And it started pulsing in time. And then we realized that the Maleco made their version. Um, so we got a bunch of them and then within 24 hours, we were all pulsing. <laughs> it was amazing. It was like it, a thing went on, like we were kind of searching for a couple days. This was like July of 21 when we were starting to rehearse the new record. And um, and that was just like the moment that things kind of, and then took shape and then we figured out how to, because we were using SPD and then we got the MPC because it has more outputs and we can have click going even if it's just for clock. Mm. It really opened up a whole new thing for us. It's like a cool analog way of locking in and everything kind of being chained together like synths and guitar pedals, but it's not, not that there's anything wrong with computer. I mean, it's basically a computer, but you're not running tracks per se. It's just like yeah. everything's really organic, but but locking. It's cool. I'm sure it's it gets fun. a huge wash of sound. Yeah. Well, Adam, I think we're going to move over and talk to Dave, but I really appreciate cool. it. Take the time to Thanks talk to us and get geeky with us. I appreciate it. Totally. All right, we're over here with Dave, slightly to the right of Adam's grandiose setup. Yep. Right Dave, how are you doing? Doing great. Very happy to be here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, thanks for uh, wanting to be included. We, we often try to track down the bass players. Yep. Oftentimes they're like, I don't got enough to talk about. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I felt a little bit like that when uh, I was asked to do this because I kind of pride myself on having like a little bit of a simpler um, counterpoint to this like horseshoe of madness <laughs> over here. And before this tour, I was even like, I'm going DI into amp this this album cycle. Like yeah. no pedals this year, um, and of course, add a pedal, add a few more. And I then see you, a contradiction. Yeah, you have a, <laughs> we have a bit of a, a contradiction here. So, but I have some stuff going on. Yeah. Well, before we get into this, let's start with this. This is a, a beautiful instrument that well it used to be beautiful, but now it has uh, character. We'll say. Um, yep. This is probably my main axe. Um, do you have any uh, guess as to what year it is? I'm gonna say younger or closer to 2022 than I think because that's just the vibe I'm getting. So I'm yeah, gonna say yeah. 2012. Okay, it's a 20. It's a 2002. Okay. Um, some, sometimes people think it's like uh, 70s or 60s because it's. But it was brand new, not relic or anything. Uh, did it was you like, drag it through a fire. <laughs> it looks like it. <laughs> I did. I I dragged it through the fire of this uh, this band's career in a lot of festivals <laughs> and just uh, kind of mistreatment, but. I just love the way it's relic on its own, just Man. through like playing outdoors and the weather changes of like shipping an instrument around um, in the way it's kind of wearing off here and like the kind of weird, I guess this is just grime um, and the paint coming off here. It just has a really cool character to it. It's super light. Um, it's the lightest bass wow. I, or yeah. bass I've ever felt. Um, actually has a cigarette burn here that sustained at the exit in. Oh, right um, here in hometown? Yeah, we had a rough one uh, that <laughs> night and I took it out on the headstock. That was a long time ago. And actually the first time I got this in, in Nashville in oh. 2003. Oh, cool. Do you yeah. remember what store? I got it at the Fender, the okay. Fender uh, factory. So um, yeah, this one's great. It used to have a gold anodized pick guard on there. Um, swapped it out for this uh, Tortoise shell. I have no idea where the knobs are. Um, yeah, it's just. Does that impact how much you play with with the tone and the volume at all? I pretty much never touch that anyway. Okay. I'm always tone all the way up. Well, on stage, I'm always tone all the way up, volume all the way up. In the studio, I'll back the tone off. Usually, we, we you know we're playing in some of these big rooms, and the front of house like wants as much definition as possible mm -hmm. because bass kind of gets soupy. Yeah. In big rooms, so. Tone all the way up. Um, That's a really good adjective. I've, I don't know if I've ever heard that one in the vernacular of guitar and bass. Yeah. Soupy. I'm going to use that. Yeah, soupy, <laughs> muddy. Yeah, I mean, bass is tough in arenas and big theaters. Yeah. It's like it gets 
you're essentially putting like an eight second or a 12 second reverb decay on bass. So it just smears it. So we're constantly trying to get more like finger noise uh, on the bass. So yeah, that's, uh, I call this Clovis. This is my Clovis bass. And what strings do you take? These are labellas. Yep, these are okay. labella uh, deep talk and bass. Uh, they're, they're flats. And I almost never change them. Okay. Unless I break one, which doesn't happen often. Probably doesn't happen. No, it doesn't happen much. I play pretty light. Um, Always with your fingers or do you bounce back and forth? I'll do some, I usually have some picks up here. I'll do some pick pick work once in a while, but I'm definitely a finger player. Okay. Pri uh, you know, primarily, for sure. Um, yep, yeah, so that's Clovis. Let's move on to the next friend. Yep. Um, I play this one a ton too. This is a, a Fullerton, so it's an 83. Oh, all right. Um, so I'm sure you know about the Fullerton era uh, precision and jazz basses when Fender started to, that was like their first time where they started reissuing, reissuing uh, instruments. Original designs. Yeah, where they got the original builders, original designs, original tools at the Fullerton plant. And, the, you know, if you can track down uh, a reissue from 82, 83, 84 of a, a Fender bass, they're basically as good as the pre-CBS uh, Fenders. They're, you know, I have a couple of them because they're just spectacular. They're so, so good. Um, it's got the pepperoni pick guard, um, which I just love that term. Yeah. <laughs> uh, not as light as this one, but the sustain is crazy. So I use this a lot because it just goes and goes. The neck is really awesome. Um, yeah, it's just a, it's just a killer instrument. What what, what happened here? These uh, fang bites. Yeah, you know that's for the uh, ashtray, uh, um, which I don't think sense. I have those even because I bought this on Craigslist ten years ago, and I don't think it came with the ashtrays. Um, but yeah, I mean this one's starting to get some natural relic here which I like to relic my instruments myself yeah. by playing a thousand shows with them. Um, that's one way of doing it. Yeah, that's, you know, exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is a killer instrument as well. I have another one of these at home. It's almost identical, except that it's black instead of a sunburst. So I've used this um, on a ton of War on Drugs recordings, um, primarily this one. This is on all the early stuff for sure. This, is, this bass is on the back of the last record, a deeper understanding. If you okay. turn, if you flip the record over, that's that's what you see on the back. I see Clovis. You see Clovis in all her glory. Um, so that's that. Um, and this is my fretless, which I play on just a couple songs. Um, I feel like people think I'm a better fretless player than I really am, because sometimes people will ask me to come play fretless on a record or something, and I'm like. I'm more of a rock player. I can get around on You're it. You're gonna be underwhelmed. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I can do it. Yeah, um, but it's not like I'm not gonna go full Jocko up here. Yeah. But I always play this one on the the bridge pickup. Um, it's got a lot of like wow to it. And I've tried other fretlesses, and they just kind of get dubby. And I love how this one just sounds like a voice going wow. It like really does a thing, almost like a sitar kind of thing. Hmm. Um, when I use this, I this is uh, I use this EQ with it because it because I use it on the bridge pickup, which is pretty quiet. So I give it, give it a little EQ boost and then just a little touch at like 1.5k mm -hmm. just to bring out more of the the, the like kind of nasal quality of it. Um, but I love the black on black of it. Really cool. It's a Tony Franklin. Um, Matt Farrar sent this to me, um, and it's great. Use it a lot. Use it on thinking of a place, um, which I think we're playing tonight. So, yeah, those are my axes. Right on. Kind of uh, have like a mini stack behind you here, Dave. Yep. Talk so, to us about this. Yeah, so I pretty much always have played SVTs uh, my whole life. Um, I have a 73 black line um, that I toured with for a long time. And uh, I just had to retube it all the time. They just, because we, we, we freight our gear all over the place. Um, and these, you know, it's a 50 year old amp. So yeah. the tubes would just go and shake loose. So I just got these. Um, this is the 50th anniversary Heritage SVT. I love it. It's really great. It's got um, two channels. This one is like a Blue Line 1969 channel. And then it has a, like a Magnavox era 1975 channel. I'm actually using both of them right now for two different. Uh, uh, lines coming off the board. 
But I mean, I got these and I've, we've already done like 60 something shows all over the world and I haven't had to touch it at all. It's been totally rock solid. Um, Do you ever mess around with the, the bright inputs and the bright? You stuff? know, I, I, uh, I don't, maybe I should. Yeah. Or maybe not. Yeah, I, I just mean, was curious if you had explored there. Maybe I should, because if you see where, the way I have this one EQ'd, <laughs> yeah. maybe I should switch that one to the bright for more for more high end. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's killer. It's just it's just really well made. I love the way the the, the faceplate is engraved here um, and on the back. It's just really killer. I love the the grill cloth. So this is just a backup. Okay. Um, we have it we have it on its side just to kind of maintain the sight lines for the lights. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of light light stuff happening. But yeah, I've played SVTs forever. I mean, there's a reason that. If you go to any festival in the world, that's and you, the and you and yeah, that's the back line. So, I'm and a, 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 I assume uh, standard eight ten. Standard eight ten. I do have a two fifteen that I was going to bring out and use both upright because you don't see a lot of two fifteen in one mm. cab. No. They only made those for a few years. Um, but again, with the sight lines, we decided to do just one. So, and actually, for a little while, I had the eight ten and the two fifteen, and we played a show at like. First Ave in Minneapolis, mm -hmm. and our front of house guy was, he just, after the gig, he was like, Dave, you weren't in the house. Because <laughs> I had both just screaming. I was like, how was the bass? And he's like, well, you literally weren't in the PA. So I was like, oh, that's not ideal. Because it was just <laughs> so freaking loud. So that's when I, you know. Maybe just outdoor gigs only. Yeah, outdoor, so you can really, <laughs> really lift off with it. But, um, but yeah, that's my baby. That's my 50th anniversary, um, killer amp. Um, thanks to Ampeg for that, for sure. Um, and these are my pedals. The pedal um, problem. Yeah, so like I was saying before, I use two channels. Um, I have like a kind of an ambient channel. We do a lot of sort of ambient interlude stuff um, to try to connect the songs. Mm -hmm. And in the past, I used to just sort of stand while the ambience swirled around me and I got, I wanted to be a part of that. So yeah. I got this, uh, Game Changer Sustain Plus pedal, and it's almost like a granular synth or something. It sort of grabs the note that you're playing and, and just sort of sustains it in this really cool way. Um, Like you're ready to play in explosions in the sky exactly or exactly <laughs> Post -rock. yeah you're about to go on a journey um <laughs> i have that going from into through the h9 which i absolutely love the h9 i have another one at home that i use in the studio all the time i think it's one of the best pedals out there for sure do you lean on it in any particular way like modulation that kind of thing or on, in this or case it's all, all yeah all in encompassing this, it's very all encompassing in this case honestly the the character of this sustain pedal you kind of just need to pile stuff on it to like try to warp it because the way it sounds without <clears throat> anything on it is like like a sine wave it has like no character to it at all it literally could sound like a synthesizer so you just need to smear it somehow. So I have it going into this H9 and then into this Keeley multi-effects. And I'm just kind of piling on like a little bit of chorus, a little bit of flange, a little bit of trim to just sort of smear this, that sine waveness of it and make it like pulsate a little bit. A little bit more movement. Yeah, just to give it some kind of movement. And I have it, I have it, uh, I'm going into this uh, EQ pedal just to warm it, or to uh, brighten it up because it's, again, pretty soupy. So it's in, it, independent of like that EQ, it's kind of tied in specifically that's right. to this. Okay. Yeah, so that's going EQ, sustain, H9, Keeley into this Neve DI. And then, and then, going. And then out to this channel two of this. Um, and then my bass channel is just, uh, you know, tuner, EQ, which I used for the fretless. Um, this Goat Keeper pedal, which has become like hugely important with our set. We all have them. And Adam's world over there, we use like drum machines and stuff, and they send out a pulse to these Goat Keeper trem pedals. Um, so it's not MIDI, it actually is just taking like a metronome. Mm. And at, at any time I can hit a trem that's exactly locked. Into everything else. Into everything else. like. 
it's really killer. I mean, we don't we don't have it running right now, so it's not locking to anything. But but it's just a really cool thing to be able to kind of flip a switch and go from like human to sort of like robot. Yeah. You know, if you want like a robotic tightness to it. So I use this on like Victim, where I literally start the song playing like finger style, and then halfway through the song, the, everything sort of kicks into double time, and I hit I hit the uh, I hit the goatkeeper. Dom is currently sending me. Can you hit the victim sample? Um, so yeah. Because for a while I was trying to play it, and like you know, I pride myself on my playing. Yeah. But I couldn't. You know, it's a it's like I'm kraut rock kind of vibe, and yeah. I couldn't. It needs to sound like metronomic, like absolutely locked. And so that we, that's when we kind of figured these pedals out. And, you know, Anthony has two of them. Adam has the big one, the big wide one, which I'm sure yeah. you'll hear about. Um, and then uh, that's going into this Megalith, which is my favorite fuzz pedal ever, for sure. Yeah, you're saying you tried, you tried piles of them, but this tried is Tried piles one. of them, you know, and I love, there's a lot of great ones. I love like a Big Muff. Um, Walrus makes a killer one, like the Jupiter. Um, it's an unsolvable equation sometimes trying yes. to find bass fuzzes that work well with bass. Yeah, because it's like you're taking something away necessarily to try to get the fuzz. It's being compressed and it sort of like saps the low end uh -huh. just because of you're degrading the sound by distorting it, which just takes away the, the frequency spectrum. But it's just really awesome. Um, it's just a really killer fuzz. I mean, it's, I have my volume down right now, but it can, you know, it can rip your head off it for sure. Havoc. Yeah, and I mean, <clears throat> and I have this phaser, which I just put on here. Honestly, I put it on there because I like had an empty spot, <laughs> <laughs> but it's become pretty interesting because when you have like the goatkeeper running, it's fun to just make the, to sort of make the, uh, the repetitive thing sort of swirl a little bit and with, Something about these three pedals together has does sort of like almost like a Moog kind of sounds. So one victim, I'll hit the. Does it just sort of does something? Some kind of alchemy happens with those three together. Um, but yeah, I mean that's pretty much my rig, other than my delightful succulent here, which. Um, we big had, part of the tone. Big part of the tone is my fake plant. Um, people <laughs> ask me about it a lot. That happened because we were joking. We had like an empty spot and Dom was like, what do you want to put in this empty spot? And I was like, well, how about like a water feature <laughs> or something? <laughs> and they were like, I hey, maybe not a water feature. And then one day I came out in Houston and there was a plant there. So yeah, just some, my little flair, I guess. But um, well, yeah, you know, the, some stuff will probably change on there, but that's, sure. where I'm at, that's where I'm at these days, you know. I always say though, like tone is here, you know, because people will ask me like, what DI do you use? Um, or what DI did you use on this song or whatever? I don't think it matters that much. I mean, I really believe it's just the way you play, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm a believer in that. That's the studious part of it is learning the instrument, but this is the fun part sometimes is, is the exploration and of also, sound. Totally, and also like you play a thousand gigs and you just sort of you just want to like add things to your arsenal, you yeah. Know? So, um, but yeah, that's what I got. Well, Dave, thank you so much. Thanks Appreciate for having it. me. Yeah, sweet. Everyone out there, stay safe. Keep rock and roll.